Today we're going to uh, continue the discussion of measurement reliability. Uh, I believe that last time we had got to a point where we'd started talking about where measurement unreliability or where random error accrues from. And we, we talked about two general areas. Uh, one is the test itself or the instrument itself and the other was the respondents to the test or the persons responding to the survey uh, items. Let me ask first, are there any questions uh, concerning the material that we talked of last time? If not, let me go on with this discussion. Uh, and, and formalize in, in, or, or recap and formalize this issue of uh, random error and the roots of random error. An overview statement is simply that, or a reminder is simply that, we observed at the outset of this discussion that one of a number of tasks that researchers have is to minimize error, to minimize systematic error and to minimize random error. That is to generate and use instruments that are reliable and valid and therefore to deal with scores, observe scores that are reliable and valid. We also observe that the issue of validity is an issue of systematic error on the one hand, but we also observe that it's a fairly complex issue, that it's not, a st it, it's not an issue that can be resolved statistically. Whether or not the GRE or any other standardized test is biased as a function of gender or biased as a function of ethnicity is not something that one can determine statistically. Even if we were to take average scores of males on the GRE and average scores of females on the GRE and observe that females on average scored lower than males on average, that is not evidence in and of itself that the test is gender biased. It might be a part of an argument to demonstrate that the test is biased as a function of gender. But it, in general, the point I'm making is that you cannot resolve issues of validity for the most part in a statistical, in a statistical way. That is not true of measurement validity, uh, reliability. You can assess measurement reliability precisely. The reality, uh, another general statement is that the reality is that all observed scores include both systematic error and random error. If we focus on random error, one reason why all observed scores include a random error component is because of you and me. Because of the random error that you and I sort of carry around with us. And we talked about two sources of random error that you and I carry around with us. One was our level of fatigue and the other was our mood. And, and we observed, I think, in each case that as persons become either more fatigued or their mood deteriorates, they're likely to behave in general in ways different from those ways they behave when they're alert and their mood is very positive. In they, they also behave specifically in different sorts of ways. And, and in the specific context of test taking or survey participation, persons who are either A, fatigued, and or B, in a poor mood, will behave in ways that are different from those persons who are not fatigued and or not in a poor mood. And in general, what, it will, what fatigue and, 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 a, and a poor mood do is to dis distract a respondent. 
They, they are not focused on the test or they're not focused on the survey. Their priority is not in answering the questions as accurately as possible or as honestly as possible or as completely as possible. Their thoughts are elsewhere and their priorities are different. Their priority may be simply getting through the test or the survey as quickly as possible. So one reason why observed scores and all then instruments and surveys uh, involve random error is because of the, the slop that you and I carry around with us. That is out of the control of the researcher. Sources of random error that are under the control of the researcher have to do with the nature of the instrument or the nature of the survey itself. We talked about test, but we talked about item ambiguity and we talked about test length. To the extent that items are ambiguous and or that the test or survey includes relatively few items, the test is unreliable, likely to be unreliable. Single item tests, that is tests or surveys that include a single question or a single statement to which you have to agree or disagree or indicate, indicate the extent to which you agree or disagree. Those tests and surveys are notoriously unreliable. And we looked at, at that issue before in, in the context of do you like this candy bar? And, and, and while that may be intuitively the most straightforward way and the, and, and, and the cleanest way of assessing how much people like a, a particular candy bar, we observe that they may think about that question in ways that you do not intend them to. Do you mean, do I like this candy bar more than others? Do you mean, do I like this candy bar more than the other forms this candy bar comes in? Do you think it, I, you know, I like it more than if it had the, the dark chocolate, if it didn't have the caramel, if it had more wafer? Um, do I like it now? Or, or do you mean, do I like, would I like it later on? Would I like it every day? Uh, and, and, and so there are all sorts of interpretations uh, that, participants or respondents can make about single items. That difficulty is reduced to the extent that you have a lot of items so that the, the random error in a sense or the ambiguity that the uh, respondent feels is spread across all of the items rather than fixed in a single item. We also observed that given this issue of test length, that is given the relationship between test length and random error or measurement unreliability, that one would advocate relatively long rather than relatively short tests. And the final thing I think we, we observed was that that in a sense contradicts the notion uh, of minimizing uh, respondent fatigue so that while one would advocate relatively long tests, there is a point of diminishing returns because at some point respondents will simply become fatigued in the process of answering the questions or responding to the survey. I think that's where we were last time. Then let's talk about the issue of um, measuring reliability, measuring instrument reliability. And we're going to talk about two ways of measuring instrument reliability. The first of those is test-retest reliability. Test-retest reliability. Test-retest reliability simply involves in overview this process. You would administer a test or a survey to persons at time one. And you would then have a score from subject one, a score from subject two, and so on and so on, down to subject N. You would then administer that same test or a similar test, and we will talk about that too, at 
a second point in time so that you would have a second score from subject one, a second score from subject two, and so on and so on, down to subject n. And you would then assess the relationship, the general relationship between the pattern of scores at time one and the pattern of scores at time two. That's in overview, in brief, the process of test retest reliability. Let me uh, talk in more detail then about test retest reliability. Test retest reliability, first of all, depends on a statistical tool called Pearson Product Moment R. Pearson Product Moment R. more often called Pearson R or simply R. But the full title is Pearson Product Moment R. And you say, okay, well, what is Pearson Product Moment R? Well, I'm going to tell you. I'm full of info. First of all, Pearson Product Moment R is a general measure of linear bivariate correlation. It's a general measure of linear bivariate correlation. Let's go through that. The first issue is that it's a general measure. It's not a measure, it's not a statistical tool that is used only in the context of test retest reliability. If you wanted to know the relationship between height and weight, you could use Pearson product moment R. If you wanted to know the relationship between person's score on scores on the uh, quantitative section of the SAT and their score on the, on the verbal section of the SAT, you could use P Pearson product moment R. That is, Pearson product moment R is a general measure of correlation. One specific application of Pearson product moment R is to test retest reliability, where the two variables are the scores at time one and the scores at time two. The second issue in this definition is that it is a measure of correlation, of, of bivariate correlation. That simply means it's a measure of, le of correlation between two variables bivariate. If you were interested, as I've said, in the relationship between per, a per, person's score on the verbal section of the SAT and, the, and their score on the quantitative section, you could use Pearson product moment R to inform you about that relationship. If you were interested, however, in the relationship between person's score on the verbal section of the GRE, their score on the arithmetic or quantitative section of the GRE, and their score on the writing section of the GRE, Pearson product moment R would be useless to you. Because you're asking, you're seeking there a measure involving three variables, or information about a relationship involving three variables, and Pearson product moment R is useful only in situations where you're concerned about the relationship between two variables. It's a general measure of bivariate correlation. Finally, it's a measure of linear correlation. If you um, expected or discovered that, relate, that variables were related in a nonlinear fashion, Pearson product moment R is no good to you because what Pearson product moment R will do is stick the straight line of best fit through those data and comment on the nature of that linear relationship, that straight line. And in this instance, it would tell you that the variables are unrelated whereas that is clearly not the case. The variables are in fact systematically related. The problem is they're not related linearly. <coughs> and so Pearson product moment R again would be an inappropriate measure of correlation. So the first, in, in, in 
sort of working our way through definitionally uh, Pearson product moment R. The, the first observation is simply to define it as a general measure of linear bivariate correlation. R must assume a value greater than or equal to minus 1 and less than or equal to plus 1. R must assume a value, Pearson, that is Pearson product moment R, must assume a value greater than or equal to minus 1, less than or equal to plus 1. You simply cannot have values of R equal to minus 3.8 or plus 19.6. R must assume a value within a very narrow range, and that range is between, on the one hand, minus 1, and on the other, plus 1. <coughs> Third, positive values of R indicate that the two variables are related positively, and negative values of R indicate that the variables are related negatively. This is obviously very straightforward. Positive values of R indicate that the two variables are related positively, whereas negative values of R indicate that the variables, the two variables, are related negatively. What that means is this. If you have two variables, X and Y. And in, this, and, and in the, 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 the context of test retest reliability, obviously, those two variables are the scores at time one and the scores at time two. If the variables are related positively, they're related in this way. That is, low scores on one variable, X, are associated with low scores on the other variable, y. And high scores on, the one, on one variable, x, are associated with high scores on the other variable, y. When variables are related positively, increases in one are associated with increases in the other, and decreases in one are associated with decreases in the other. In general, height and weight are related in this way. The taller you are, the more you weigh. I was going to say the shorter you are, but that's a politically incorrect term. The less tall you are, the less you generally weigh. So positive relationships are those relationships in which increases in one variable are associated with increases in the other, and decreases in the value of one variable are associated with decreases in the value of the other. Negative relationships, meanwhile, are... about y and x. Negative relationships, meanwhile, are of this kind. Negative relationships occur when low values on one variable are associated with high values on the other. In this case, when low variables in x are associated with high variables in Y. And likewise, when low, va low values of Y are associated with high values of X. When variables, two variables are related negatively, they're related in a seesaw fashion. So that as the values of one increase, the values of the other decrease. Familiarity with a task and number of errors in committed in performance of the task 
are related negatively. That is, the more familiar you are with a task, the fewer errors you're likely to commit. The less familiar you are with a task, the more errors you're likely to commit. Are there any questions about positive and negative relationships? Yes. No, not really. Can you, I, I didn't get the last definition of our positive values, that last statement. Let me go back. Let's deal with, with positive and negative relationships for the moment. We'll talk about the last attribute of R, and then I'll ask for questions about Pearson product moment R, and we can sort all of those out, okay? The last attribute, then, of, of Pearson product moment R, that is four, is that high absolute values of R indicate a strong relationship, and low absolute values of R indicate a weak relationship. High absolute values of R indicate a strong relationship, and low absolute values of R indicate a, a weak relationship between the two variables. Let's take a look at a variety of situations. When R equals zero, variable one and variable two are independent of one another. There is no linear bivariate relationship. They're independent of one another. There is they share no attributes. They share no variance. At the other extreme, when R equals plus or minus 1.0, variable 1 and variable 2 are redundant. That is, they, we could, using a Venn diagram, using these circles to represent variable 1 and variable 2, if R equaled plus 1.0 or minus 1.0, it would indicate that the two variables were redundant. There was nothing unique about either one of them. Yeah. One was simply the reflection of the other. Given those two extremes, when R assumes a value between 0 and plus 1 or minus 1, it simply indicates that there is some overlap and at the same time some uniqueness. That overlap increases as the absolute value of R increases. So we might say that this is, if we could say that here R, R is plus or minus 0.5. If we were to increase the value of R to plus or minus 0.8, we would simply be observing that there was more overlap. I'm not sure I've really accomplished that, <laughs> but that there was more, more overlap between the two sets of scores and less uniqueness. Perhaps if I come around like this, it'll be better. Leonardo da Vinci, I am not. Told Leonardo could draw perfect circles freehand. Show off. <laughs> Let me ask, first of all, a question specific to relational strength. Are there any questions about interpreting absolute values of R? 
Absolute values of R simply provide information about relational strength. Low absolute values of R, and you cannot have a value of R, an absolute value of R lower than zero, indicate no relationship. Therefore, absolute values of R very close to zero, 0 0.08, 0 0.1, 0 0.12, indicate a very weak relationship. At the other extreme, if R is plus or minus 1.0, you have a perfectly strong relationship. There is no uniqueness about variable 1 or variable 2. So that values, absolute values of R close to 1.0 indicate a very strong relationship. They indicate a great deal of overlap. And, and, and I should represent that in more clearly. If R is plus or minus 0.8, you have this sort of relationship. Much more overlap and and, and much less uniqueness between the two variables. So first of all, are there any questions about relational strength? No, I don't. There was somebody saying, always looks at me. No? I'm scanning. Let me ask then, are there any questions about Pearson product moment R in general? What, what Pearson product moment R is, or how one would go about interpreting values of Pearson product moment R? Yes. Um, earlier you made the example of on the GRE if you wanted to compare and you gave like three different sections of the GRE. Then would it be fair to say that you could compare two different parts of the GRE, just not three different parts. Is that correct? Yes. And what would be the difference between when you had, because Pearson product moment is linear, correct? Linear it, and bivariate. So then what would that be measuring when you had like kind of like the slope? What would the difference be? First of all, the answer to the first question is yes. If you were interested in the relationship, at least the linear relationship, between person scores on two sections of the GRE, you could use Pearson product moment R usefully. The second question that you ask um, regarding nonlinear relationships. Pearson product moment R by just by definition, and that means by its computational definition too, um, is a measure of linear correlation. Now I've presented to that to you in, in the in, in the in the simplest way. I've shown you a nonlinear relationship and I've said that um, Pearson product moment R would not be appropriate in, in that circumstance. And that is true. And there are all sorts of nonlinear relationships. This sort of relationship apparently describes the level of anxiety that you and I typically feel towards some threat. Tests is, is exams, uh, hurricanes out in the Gulf, you know. When the hurricane is way out in the Gulf, when a test is some distance away, when I distribute the, the uh, syllabus at the beginning of the semester, you have typically, persons have a low level of anxiety because the threat is distant. And what is more, even as that test becomes closer and closer, 
that level of anxiety as that as that hurricane moves through the Gulf and approaches landfall, you and your level of anxiety and my level of anxiety typically does not change a great deal. Two days before the exam, or a day before the exam, or two days or a day before that hurricane hits Galveston, you and I experience not simply an increase in anxiety, typically we experience a huge increase. That's the point at which you're throwing up in your commode uh, or you're down the uh, grocery store trying to buy batteries and actually getting into fist fights with the, per with the other people who are suddenly trying to do the same. There are a lot of nonlinear relationships. Pearson product moment R is not a, a useful measure of those relationships because Pearson product moment R, by its very nature, is sensitive only to linear relationships. More precisely, it's sensitive to the linear component of a relationship so that it will distort the relationship that is curvilinear to one that is linear. It will, it will put the line of best fit through those data. And sometimes the answer you get will be more uninformative than on other occasions. If you have a relationship of this kind, a sine function, Pearson product moment R will stick a straight line through that, those, that array of data and it will tell you that there is, it will give you a value of or of essentially zero indicating that X and Y are unrelated when that is clearly not the case. In this instance, the straight line of best fit may be a line of this sort, and R will, be, will equal some value, or it will assume some value greater than zero. So that you would, in fact, probably conclude that there's some relationship between anxiety and threat. But the nature of the relationship is absolutely lost using Pearson product moment R, because the relationship is curvilinear, and Pearson product moment R by its very nature is only commenting on the linear portion of that relationship. Is that, yes, can you? So when, when you're looking at the relationship, will below the line or where the points are is what we're looking for? Would you shade in below the line or would you, you just wouldn't look shade at the, in anywhere? You don't. Okay. You don't shade in anywhere. What you do is you let the data fall as they may. And then you say Pearson product moment R and then you hit the execute button and you will get some value of R. You should not be concerned, that is, about computing R. You should be concerned about, first of all, being able to def define it. What is it? It's a general measure of linear bivariate correlation. You should, second, be concerned that you know the attributes of Pearson product moment R, that it can assume a value only between minus 1 and plus 1, and so on and so on. And then you should be concerned, third, that you be able to interpret values of Pearson product moment R. If, for example, in regard to the, la the last issue, interpreting values of R, R equals plus 0.7, R equals plus 0.5. This is relationship A and this is relationship B. Which is stronger, relationship A or relationship B? Let me ask the question again. 
Which is stronger? Let me phrase the question differently. Which is stronger, relationship A or relationship B? A. Relationship I because 0.7, the absolute value here is 0.7, the absolute value here is 0.5. The higher the absolute value, the stronger the relationship. Relationship C, minus 0.7. Which is the strongest relationship? B. A and B. A is still strong. The weakest relationship here is B. Because if let's forget whether these relationships are positive or negative. 0.5 is simply the lowest score here, which indicates that that relationship, relationship B, is the weakest. The question of which is the strongest is in a sense a trick question because the answer is relationship A and relationship C are of equal strength. The only difference is that one is positive and one is negative. When dealing with the issue of relational strength, you're interested in the absolute value of R and you're not concerned with whether R is positive or negative. When you are concerned about the direction of the relationship, you're not at all interested in the value of R, you're simply in interested in whether the value is positive or negative, and so whether the relationship is positive or negative. Are there any questions about Pearson product moment R? Yes. Okay, maybe it's jumping ahead, but you wouldn't be able to use this like if you had like a bar graph or something like that, even if it were, because it needs to be linear. That's let's, it. let's forget it. Let's forget it. Let's package that away. Okay. Um, put it in a lead line box. <laughs> Go to that draw within the draw within the draw. That little box that only you and I know about and put your lead line box in there close it and close it. I say that because I think we I want you to focus on on two things here. Two, There are two balls in the air in a sense. One is Pearson product moment R. But the other is and the larger ball is test retest reliability. You know, we got into this discussion in this way. I wanted to talk about test, retest, reliability. But in order to do that in an informed way, I had to talk about Pearson product moment R. And I knew that if I introduced Pearson product moment R and didn't say anything else, you'd say, well, what is Pearson product moment R? So I thought I'd tell you. Um, I thought I'd let you into its secrets as well. But there are two balls in the air here. Pearson product moment R, but the larger ball is test, retest, reliability. We know that, you know that, because R is a general measure of correlation, that it can be used in a wide variety of situations. Situations in that involve, in which researchers are interested in, in the, the extent to which two variables are related in a linear way. The specific application that we're interested in is the application of test, retest, reliability. And in test, retest, reliability, of course, the x and y variables are the scores on the test at time 1, which we could call x, and the scores on the test at time 2, which we could call y. Let's explore this just in an informal way. If each of you were to take to respond to the same test, let's say if you were to take the GRE today, so each of you would get a score on the GRE 
today, if you were then to take the GRE a month from now, you get a second score on, that, on the GRE. Let me ask you, what sort of relationship for the class as a whole would you expect between those two sets of scores? Would you expect a positive relationship? Would you expect no relationship? Or would you expect a negative relationship? I can, let me, let me, really, let me rephrase the question. Would you expect that, in general, the persons who scored high at time one would score high at time two, and the persons who scored low at time one would score low at time two? That would suggest, that would be the expectation of a positive relationship. The expect, expectation of no relationship would mean that this, how people scored at time one inform, didn't, provided no information about how they scored at time two. Some would score higher, some would score lower, some would achieve the same score. And the expectation of a negative relationship would mean that you would expect people who scored high at time one to score low at time two, and the persons who scored low at time one to score high at time two. So let me go back and now ask the original question. Would you have the expectation of a positive relationship, of no relationship, or of a negative relationship? Man, I thought we were moving here. I thought as I went through, lights went on. I think it would be no relationship because... No. No? No. No. It would be a positive... It would be a positive relationship. One would expect a positive relationship because the attributes that you and I have, the skills that you and I have, are stable. Yes. Your arithmetic ability doesn't shift dramatically from day to day. Your verbal ability doesn't shift dramatically from day to day. The extent of to which you're an extrovert, your extroversion doesn't shift dramatically from day to day. Your behavior doesn't shift dramatically from day to day. Those people, if that happens, we lock you up. We put you away. We put you on drugs to regulate your behavior. Because what you and I expect of ourselves and what we expect of others, what we expect of the world in general, is that it will be consistent. Not that you will wake up, go to bed one evening, not being able to speak a word of French, and wake up the next day fluent in the language. Not that you will go to bed one evening fluent in Portuguese and wake up the next morning and not even be able to say the word Portuguese. We expect, and it's, the, it's because it's the nature of the world, consistency. One specific application of that expectation is in regard to this issue of test, retest reliability. If I were measuring your ex level of extroversion, if I were measuring your level of self-consciousness, if I were measuring your arithmetic ability, your reading ability, and if I had administered two tests of that skill or that attribute, separated by some time period, we would expect, I would expect anyway, that there would be consistency across time that those of you who were relatively extroverted at time one would be relatively extroverted at time two. Those of you who were relatively introverted at time one would be relatively introverted at time two. Those of you who had relatively high arithmetic ability at time one would ha show re relatively high arithmetic ability at time two. And likewise, low arithmetic ability at time one, low arithmetic ability at time two. The point of this 
is that in the context of test-retest reliability, I think our expectation is of a positive relationship. More especially, we have the expectation of a strong positive relationship. All you have to do is think about the nature of the world. If you were to discover in this course or in any course that as a group not we're not talking now about the movement of some small number of individuals but as a group those of you who scored high on the first exam scored low on the second exam and persons who had scored low on the first exam scored high on the second exam surely something would run through your head. Something unkind would run through your head. Something unkind about the course and something unkind about me. And something unkind about the exam. Because you know that the, that the nature of the world is quite opposite. That is not to say that individuals don't move. It's to say that the world as a whole doesn't shift in this radical way. So we would not only, I think in the context of test, retest reliability, expect a positive relationship between the scores achieved at time one by subject one, subject two, and so on down to subject n. We would expect a strong relationship positive relationship. And in fact, that's reflected in what is essentially the sort of baseline level of reliability. Measures are considered to be acceptably reliable if when you correlate these two sets of scores, you achieve a value of R equal to or greater than 0.7 plus 0.7. Values of R equal to or greater than plus 0.7 suggest that in the instrument is acceptably reliable. And of course, above 0.7 is more desirable. Below 0.7, and now we're not concerned simply with the absolute value, but with the sign as well. So from plus 0.7 down to minus 1, the instrument is considered unreliable. Yes. Um, I'm a little confused by that. Would it be plus 0.7 or plus or minus 0.7? It wouldn't be plus or minus. We've said already, the question is, is that expected value of R plus or minus 0.7? And the answer is no, it's plus 0.7. Because we have an expectation that of consistency across time. And if scores are consistent across time, then those who were at the top at time one will tend to remain there at time two. And persons who were at the bottom at time one will, be, will tend to remain there at time two. That is, the scores will be related in this way. Persons who were at the bottom at time one will be at the bottom at time two. And persons who were at the top at time one will be at the top at time two. I guess I was just confused because when we were going over the examples A, B, and C, when we were, I guess that would be Pearson product moment, I was fine when you did the A and the B, which has had stronger relationship. Because when we were looking at this example. Yes. But then, this has nothing to do, well, it doesn't, it's not that it has nothing to do with test-retest reliability. 
This is an example of relational strength. And we observed that when, if asked which of these three relationships is the strongest, the correct answer is relationship A and relationship C. These two relationships are of equal strength. It's simply that one is positive and the other negative. But when you're concerned about relational strength, you're not concerned about, you're concerned only, let me phrase it this way, you're concerned only in the absolute value, that is, this portion of the index. When you're concerned as well about relational strength, you're only increase, interested in whether the relationship or whether the, the value of R is positive or negative. Well, we have, we're interested in both in the context of re -te test, retest reliability. We expect, first of all, that the relationship will be positive, that persons who score low at time one will score low at time two in general, and those who score high at time one will score high at time two in general. And we expect that to be a strong relationship because we're measuring the same attribute or the same skill which should change minimally across time particularly short periods of time and it's not we're not worried if we're measuring let's say reading ability and your reading ability improves across time which it will uh, particularly to the extent that you're relatively young. But, but that will happen to everybody. Yeah, it's, and, and while some people may go from relatively poor readers to relatively skilled readers, and some may go from relatively skilled to relatively poor, that is simply not true of, of, of people as a whole. Those readers who are, are skilled, re persons who are skilled readers at seven years of age tend to be skilled readers at 14 years of age. And those who are unskilled at seven tend to be unskilled at 14. You know that. All you have to do is reflect on your own experiences. Some of you have said to me, in various vocal tones. Dr. Douglas, I'm not good at math and, and I'm not going to be good in this course. Were you ever good at math? <laughs> yes. Was there ever, was it? Uh, <laughs> and, and, then you, and, and then you had this traumatic experience. You, yeah, yeah. Yeah, somebody came along with big boots and a big voice and said, you're not good at math. And some, some people clearly have experienced some critical event, some critical, some produce some critical change. But in general, people who are skilled at a young age, at the beginning of some period of time are skilled later on and if you are slow to get it to start with you tend always to be slow to get that thing this is what happens at work you have a you'll go out and you'll get a job and you'll be put on probation for three months and so will everybody else and some of you some of that group will get it and they will breathe a sigh of relief and they will prosper. They will be called good people, and they shall retain their job. There will be m others amongst that group who, are, who do poorly, and they shall be called bad people, and they shall lose their job. And they shall be cast out into the, into the desert, into the barren land, Because the assumption that every co corporation makes is if you don't get it here, you ain't going to get it here. 
And if you do get it here, there's a higher chance that you'll get it here too. And the same assumptions are inherent in test retest reliability. So that there's this threshold value of plus 0.7 indicating an expectation of a strong positive relationship between the two sets of scores. Let me make a, 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 a few observations about this. One observation is that in communication at least, you will encounter a substantial amount of research where, in which researchers use instruments that have reliable, test retest reliabilities of much less than plus 0.7, plus 0.42, plus 0.51. Why is that the case? Because that researcher has not pilot tested that instrument. Instead, the researcher has found 128 people who he or she can incorporate as participants in their research and has administered the test or the instrument at that point. And they're stuck with the data they've acquired. The choice is to abandon the data and go out and get another 126 people or whatever and, and collect, revise the instrument, pre-test the instrument, and then use it on the new 126 people, which takes a great deal of time and means they've wasted the day that they have in hand. Or they can plow on, and they choose often to plow on because their tenure clock is ticking. That doesn't mean that your tenure clock is ticking as a consumer of their research. And simply because they are sufficiently unsophisticated to use unreliable measures and so unreliable data, you don't have to. You should understand the notion of garbage in, garbage out. If data are unreliable, there's nothing you can do to infuse them with reliability. You can perform as many statistical tricks as you like. They're still garbage. Let me make a second observation, too, about this notion of test-retest reliability. There are really three ways that you can generate these two sets of scores. One is to administer the same test at time one as you used at time two. That can be a problem because people remember how they've responded. They also remember what they responded to. And so their responses can change simply as a function of that memory and that being the case that their new responses, that is the time two responses, to some extent, are independent of their, their skill level. There are then two other ways of generating these two sets of scores from the same group of individuals. One is, and, and in general, if you're interested in, in, in generating tests or instruments that, let's say, include 40, comprise 40 items, both of these other solutions require that you generate a much larger pool of items. A hundred items or a hundred and fifty items or two hundred items. This is the method used to generate the SAT tests, the GRE tests, LSAT, DMAT, MCAT and so on. And the first is random selection without replacement. That is, you randomly reach into these 150 items, select 40 of them, and use those at, at time one. You then do not put those items back in the hopper. Did I say random selection with, without replacement? You then do not put those items back in the, in the pool, back in the hopper. Instead, you now reach into the pool a second time and pick out 40 more items, and those new 40 items comprise your test at time two. 
That is random selection without replacement because you're not putting the original 40 items back in the pool. Random selection with replacement, you reach into the original pool of items, you, re you pick out 40 of them. That's the test at time one. You put those items back in the hopper, you rummage around, you pull out 40 items for your test at time two. Given that method, random selection with replacement, there is some probability that one or more items that was on the time one test will be on the time two test. Using either of these methods, while the difficulty of the test may vary from time one to time two, time one test may be more difficult, time two test more difficult, that should not affect the reliability of the instrument because the error will be systematic. It will simply affect the group as a whole. As a whole, the groups, if the, te if the time two test is more difficult, the score should go down. If the time two test is easier, the score should go up. But the group as a whole should move in a, in a similar way with some individual shifts. That is the end of the uh, discussion on measurement uh, validity and measurement reliability. Um, we will move on through uh, to the next topic uh, on Tuesday um, and I would ask you to read uh, the, the uh, relevant material in the text for, for next time. If you, if you have, there, there is no